Endless Descent's a 1990 sci-fi horror film from director Juan Piquer Simon. The movie opens with some men in black waking up submarine designer Wick Hayes. It doesn't matter how much booze you dump on him, he already smells like the floor of a strip club. Is that you, Pliskin? Ah, oh, he remembers. If that's Pliskin, he really let himself go. They tell him there was an accident with his experimental sub, the Siren 1, and they're sending him in the Siren 2 to investigate. Well, look at that. There's the model of the submarine they're gonna use for the special effects later on. Wick meets up with Edmund Perdom. Perdom's in so many of these. He's like the classy Buck Flower of B movies. Perdom plays the CEO Steensland of the company that built his submarine designs. Wick is channeling equal parts Patrick Swayze and Kurt Russell here. How's that pretty wife of yours? She's still in the Navy? Ask her lawyer. I'm guessing he's the lawyer. Steensland tells Wick that the nuclear generator of the Siren 1 went down and they lost contact. They tell Wick it was his faulty design that caused the sub to fail, so he has to go find it to clear his name. Wick gets on the sub, which is under NATO control, which makes it a military rescue. Rivera and Skeets are talking about Wick. Skeets? Wick and his glorious hair helmet go to the mess hall. The crew doesn't like him because they think he's responsible for the Siren 1's disaster. The captain shows up and oh shit! They better start squaring their asses away and shitting Tiffany cufflinks. Wick has to bunk with Robbins, the computer specialist. Roll the stock footage of a completely different sub. Someone's messing with the ship's computers. Wick meets up with his ex-girlfriend, Lieutenant Crowley. She, of course, is upset that he's on board. Uh, do you want to run a diagnostic on the turbos? Yes, that's a good idea. It's been real nice talking with you, Lieutenant Crowley. Let's do a full diagnosis of both turbos. Diagnosis, not diagnostic? They dive the sub and the first thing they do is crash right into an iceberg. You seeing this? And you thought I was kidding. Wick is upset because some of the design alterations to make room for military hardware have screwed up the sonar. While scanning their frequencies, they get an unusual broadcast. Better check this out, sir. Can you identify that? It's a black box signal, sir. The broadcast they get is coming from about halfway down this huge rift, so they dive down after it. When they get down there, they find some unusual plant life. They send Sven out to get a sample of the plants and pictures of the sub wreckage. Sven's investigating and, wait a minute, he's 22,000 feet underwater. The deepest dive a human's ever done is 2,000 feet. The pressure of the water would have crushed him instantly. He goes to get a sample of the plant life. Cutting weed samples isn't going to be easy. <sighs> really thick. Weed sample affirmative, sir. Oh yeah, that looked incredibly difficult. He sends the sample up and goes deeper to the sub wreckage. While diving, he finds the body of one of the crew. I'm okay, uh, I'll explain to you later, sir. Isn't this something you should inform them of now and not later? Could send diver two down to relieve you. Negative, sir. It's okay, I've already relieved myself. He finds part of the Siren 1 and takes some pictures, which upsets a nearby octopus who crushes him to death. The captain asks Robbins what he thinks happened. Speculation, Mr. Robbins. Why would he ask the computer specialist? A giant underwater piece of tissue paper latches onto the ship and pulls it into the rift. They use some Star Trek maneuvers and manage to free themselves from the creature. Captain, tell Robbins to reverse the polarity of the ship's radar cloaking device. That should allow the outside electrical field to shock it. The ship is sinking fast, so they move to land it on a ledge. Good thing this submarine has landing gear. It's also a good thing Wick has logged hundreds of hours in Lunar Lander. The seaweed sample the lieutenant put in the fish tank is killing the fish and growing at an alarming rate. Skeets and Rivera are working on repairing the damage. Skeet, 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 skeet. In a tunnel on the side of the rift, they look for the black box. They head into the cave, and something about this reminds me of a girl I once slept with. At the end of the tunnel, they find a subterranean cavern where the black box is located. Yeah. They were here, Captain. Take a look at the screen. Yes, take a look at that screen. In fact, there's two of them. Why is there a screen window underwater? The captain sends the crew out in hazmat suits with fully automatic weapons. They take a raft to the shore. Marshall, Will, and Holly on the routine expedition. While in the cave, they find a bunch of chemicals and... Oh shit, it's the flood! Fleming's attacked by this weird parasite thing and they have to kill him. Philippe gets his leg bitten off by whatever the hell this is. They search, but they can't find Rivera. The team finds a lab, but the crew's dead. 
Mueller finds the oxygen room has been turned into a hentai film. Don't touch the naughty tentacle, don't touch the ah. The captain and Crowley go to see Mueller's now dead. On the way back to the ship, the dock falls in the water and gets eaten. Robbins and the captain investigate the discs Wick brought back. They find out that the sub was really being used as part of an experiment on underwater genetic mutations. Wick, the captain, Skeets, and Crowley head back out to look for Rivera. Robbins stays back in the sub. They find a room where all the mutants are coming from. A bunch of alien baby egg sacs are just laying around. Rivera's trapped in the genetic machine. Skeets gets eaten by the gigantic chocolate starfish. Come on, get some! They blow up the machine, pumping out the mutations. Good thing there always seems to be explosive barrels laying around in these situations. Wick, the captain, and Crowley head back to the sub. Not a surprise to anyone, Robbins was in on the whole thing. Robbins goes to close the hatch to escape, and if the air's toxic and there's killer mutants wandering around, why would he leave the front door open? And to think I trusted that brown nosed son of a bitch. They manage to pop the seal and get back into the sub. Robbins takes the survivors captive. He explains that they brought Wick down here to blow up the sub to cover their tracks and blame both mishaps on Wick. The captain fights off Robbins and smears his face against one of the infected crew. Wick repairs the ship and the captain sets the sub to explode to destroy the rift. Detonation sequence activated. 120 seconds to detonation. Shouldn't they give themselves more than two minutes to get to an escape pod? The captain shows Wick and Crowley he has to stay behind because he's infected. This is the longest two minutes ever. Wick and Crowley escape and the captain blows up the sub. Run. Then, a very tender moment with Wick and Crowley. The movie was filmed mostly in Madrid, Spain for about $1.3 million. Originally, the film was supposed to take place in outer space, but after the wave of mainstream underwater films in 1989, the script was changed. While this was not director J.P. Simon's first time doing sci-fi horror, it was definitely his best. It plays a bit more mainstream than some of his movies, but it still has that great J.P. Simon gore. Unfortunately, some of the special effects were bad, but some of them were quite good. So good, in fact, that it won Best Special Effects in the 1990 Goya Awards. The cast was a huge part of why this worked. The always great Arlie Ermey played the captain. While he's best known for playing Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, it was very cool to see him playing a more subdued, and dare I say it, nice captain. Badass Jack Scalia played Wick. While he did a ton of television in the 80s, I knew him from his awesome 90s PM Entertainment action flicks, like T-Force, Dark Breed, and The Silencers. The criminally underused Ray Wise was Robbins. From Robocop to Reaper to Infestation, and even She Spies, no matter what what I see him in, he's always outstanding. At 79 minutes, the movie did fly by a bit too quickly. They could have spent some more time in the sub either doing character development or to create tension as they moved closer to the Siren 1. It didn't detract from the movie, but a longer runtime would have made it feel a little more complete. Once they find the Siren 1, it almost feels like a race to the finish. Overall, it's an entertaining film and a great collection of some of the best action movie cliches. Gruff, hard-drinking, poofy-haired hero with a ridiculous name. Ex-girlfriend who becomes love interest again before the film's over. Tough as nails military captain. Traitor. Exploding barrels. Self-destruct sequence. Evil corporation. And wise cracking black guy. Nothing. Shut up, bitch! 